Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Crankle. Um, I'm the co-founder of a game studio called Night School. We're down in Los Angeles. And uh, we started in 2014, like the middle of 2014. And um, we've put out two games. Uh, the first one is a game called Oxenfree, which is a sort of like a supernatural coming of age adventure. Um, and then we also did a game in the middle of the year last year uh, based on Mr. Robot, the TV show. And that's sort of like a paranoid texting thriller. Somebody likes a game. <laughs> So uh, this is a picture of me and my co-founder, Adam Hines, who is also my cousin and is also sitting right there uh, and is mortified. Yes, that little sweet potato wrote all of Oxenfree. Uh, so when uh, Adam and I were little kids, we just always cared about story and cared about games. And that was something that we, um, you know, as we started the studio, that was really the thing that we thought we could focus in on and make something uh, really special. And so for us, the story focus games that we make are all about kind of letting players push and pull at narrative in ways that they haven't seen um, in games before. And so today, uh, I wanted to talk about how our team has been approaching that just specifically with, uh, with Oxenfree. So we'll go back to 2014. Um, we were there crammed in a little 600 square foot box in Glendale, California. Uh, and there are obviously no shortage of amazing dev teams who are doing really great storytelling in games. And so we knew we would have to do something really different to stand out because, um, again, I'm sure half the, this room is making extraordinary story games. Um, so the thing that we started to really come back to over and over again that we were observing was this idea that most games um, really kind of treat gameplay and story in these very siloed uh, moments, right? So you would have a mechanics-driven encounter, then you move to some storytelling. That storytelling is either something that tells you what you're going to do next or is there for emotional impact. Then you go back to the mechanical, uh, uh, to the mechanics-driven encounter. And so even in the best stuff on the market, that, that works well, but we thought as a small team, something that we could try to do is make a game where the mechanics only serve to push the story. And so every decision that we made in the game then would focus on that. And um, that was really sort of the foundation for, uh, for the studio and for Oxenfree. So, you know, in the, in the very beginning, we only had a really basic idea of what Oxenfree was going to end up being. Um, you know, we had some pretty specific references for what we wanted the feel to be, but we didn't know what the story would turn out to be or the mechanics. Um, you know, I mentioned it before, but it was like supernatural elements we thought were really cool, uh, coming of age we thought was really cool, and if you look at all these different movies and books and shows that are, you know, referenced up here, um, they all have this really underlying vibe that is frankly pretty well mined territory in uh, movies and other media, but you haven't seen a lot of it in games. And so we kind of keyed into that and went, oh, this could be a really interesting space to play in um, for a game. So uh, Oxenfree's basic story came together really quickly. Um, we, you know, it's about this girl named Alex, and uh, the game takes place uh, and on an overnight party uh, where Alex and her stepbrother, Jonas, go off, and um, at, right after the first act, they end up unwittingly opening this crazy ghostly rift, <laughs> and uh, they uh, then have to kind of uncover the mystery of the island and what they've just unleashed. And we also unpack a fair amount of trauma in Alex's life, uh, rooted in issues with her, uh, her older brother, Michael, who had passed away. Um, so usually, and I'm sure a lot of folks in this room uh, would think maybe like we kind of got ahead of ourselves because even for us as a team, you know, we'd historically like to find a set of mechanics and then build the game around that set of mechanics and build the narrative to support those mechanics. And we were a little kind of nervous about that. Like we, we were falling in love with this story and maybe a little bit too early. Um, but we, because we were loving where the story was headed, <clears throat> we decided to kind of keep pushing and let the, the that story drive all of our mechanics purpose or uh, choices. So I want to take a step back for a second and talk about the the what versus the why. Um, and that's really, you know, for night school that's a guiding principle of all of the games that we do is having a clear understanding and delineation of the what and the why. So what is the player doing and then why is the player doing that because that hopefully there's a meaningful connection between those two things. 
Um, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher this slightly, but you know, in film, uh, the the what is the plot, um, and that is you know the sequence of events that take place over the course of the film, um, and then the story is the why because it tells us why the characters are on the journey they're on um, and how the, that series of events happens. In games, you know, games are primarily a what medium because they're interactive. And so uh, the what is typically, you know, the set of mechanics and encounters. Um, and then the why still remains the story. So I'm sure this isn't a new concept to anybody in this room, but um, many games treat their what as a toy, right? So you've got like running and jumping, or aiming and firing, or flinging, or katamariing, whatever that is. Um, and these are all these really fully developed toys uh, that are fun to interact with at a very primal level because games really excel at the what, right? Like that's uh, so much of the purpose of uh, why we all love them. But then a toy alone, no matter how fun it is, can get boring kind of quickly if there's no feeling of progression or escalation. Um, so that's where games traditionally introduce things like you know, challenge or changes to how the toy works um, or adding new variables to impede your ability then to use that toy. So, you know, in games, story is usually just a catalyst then to the real game of what you're doing. And so we were finding ourselves in this dilemma of how could we make a story-focused game with no overt challenge uh, be mechanically satisfying? Like what mechanic would best represent the story that we were developing and um, how could we escalate that over the course of the game? And we kept coming back to communication, like being that central piece. Um, so if Alex's story is why you play Oxenfree, then communication and how we communicate just as humans um, it would become our what. So um, kind of quickly just breaking down like what was, uh, what is Alex's why and what is Alex's what in the game? So um, her why before these kids open this crazy hell gate uh, is, is basically just like overcoming awkwardness, you know, the typical kind of teen stuff uh, that you would expect of a senior in high school um, and allowing you to define her as a character or uh, kind of role play and be yourself, uh, you know, as, as Alex. Um, and then after the gate, opens up, um, you're forging bonds with friends and your new stepbrother, but in a very kind of mortal way, um, instead of the sort of teen BS way that happens before the gate opens. Um, you're coming to terms with these deep-seated issues regarding your brother's death, and you're uncovering the mystery of the island's inhabitants so uh, that you can bring peace to the island. Um, but then, you know, if you break that down into the what, it's actually super basic. Uh, it's essentially just like exploring and communicating. Um, so instead of escalating challenges to what you are doing, we would escalate the stakes of why you do it through story. So we set a very core rule set for movement, navigation, communication, but we would then tweak elements of the story over and over and over again to sort of escalate it and give that feeling of challenge. So every creative decision we made then was intended to smooth out story interactivity. And where that uh, ended up putting us was, you know, we, we kind of looked at it as three different buckets for our main kind of creative decision making process. Uh, exploration, which is, you know, pretty straightforward, communication, um, and then the visual design that needs to house those prior decisions. Um, so from an exploration front, you know, how, does, how can we make exploration more uh, conducive to storytelling? So the first decision we made was that movement has to be contiguous through the whole game. Like we never wanted there to be a cutscene, so there's never a cutscene in the game, and it was crucial to us to say we're never going to take control away from the player at any time, and always they have the ability to you know, have some form of input and move. Um, and that was a big key thing that became a massive, had a huge ripple, ripple effect and big design challenge, both from a writing perspective and a design perspective. Um, the other piece of, of exploration that we thought would uh, be you know, um, important for us was to, to make it more of a big screen kind of lean back experience and not a point and click game. Like you can play it that way, but we wanted to make sure that the foundation of the game was still um, something that you could play with a, with a controller and feel really kind of natural and fluid. So more importantly though, probably most importantly, is really the, uh, the kind of bucket of communication, right? So if we're gonna make 
communication, the nucleus of this game, the act of choosing dialogue for us needed to feel like an ability. And that was a big distinction that we wanted to make up front, where dialogue is not a set of menu choices that have right or wrong or good or bad or morally gray or whatever. It really needed to feel like an ability and an extension of you. And so um, that meant that you know, in the writing process, Adam, as he was working on it, needed to think through um, a wide array of, uh, of options that I'll, I'll kind of go into in a bit. So another kind of quick aside, uh, I had never heard of this term a pre-mortem before. The, you guys might know this term, but I did not know it at all. And I was looking up how not to freak out before a talk because I knew I'd be up here slightly freaking out, which is basically happening. And uh, I found this TED talk and this guy was talking about um, you could stop a stressful moment before it happens by doing a pre-mortem. And a pre-mortem is, it's like a business concept where at the beginning of a project, you look at the end goal and the product that you're going to build and you play out in your head every possible scenario that could go totally wrong, like just be super imaginative and think of the worst case of everything and then you work, whoops, you work your way backwards then and now you've ideally um, sort of covered off on a majority of these scenarios and you're prepared for them before they come and it calms you down. And that's the type of thing that you could apply to yourself in your everyday existence. And so what, um, what I thought was really interesting while looking that up just for my own non-freaking out <laughs> reasons was that Oxenfree's writing process was essentially a big pre-mortem because um, the way Adam approached writing Oxenfree, you know, as often as possible, the player uh, needed to have dialogue choices that they would naturally want. So again, it's not about good or bad or light or dark, it's just like, what would they naturally want to say? And so, they, and, and our goal internally, even as we were play testing it, was to make sure that, you know, one of the big things that we did in all of our play tests was go, was there ever a moment you were left wanting to say something? Did you feel like Alex didn't have, you know, queued up in the chamber a, a line that you would want to say? And that went, we, we went back and did a lot of rewrites based on elements of that. Um, so Adam then, you know, had to read players' minds basically in advance, and that is why uh, the script for this four or five hour game is 1,800 pages long. Sorry, Adam. Uh, <laughs> So another big thing for us, you know, when we think about communication as a mechanic and as an ability was to ensure that Alex would never talk unless the player makes her. Um, this is something that, you know, we thought we could put another kind of big stamp on um, where we would go, you know, if other games you have these moments where the player character, even maybe the player character gets to choose a line, but then immediately thereafter the NPC says something and then there's kind of a ping pong back and forth and you wait for a discussion to end so that you can then jump in and say something. We said, no, we, we want it to be every time she talks, it's because you make her talk, right? So there's never a moment in the game where Alex will say something unless you decide to initiate that. And that was really crucial in making it feel more like an ability and less like a set of uh, uh, menu options, right? So that also had a pretty insane uh, ripple effect in terms of how the game was designed because one, now the players can be super just weird and mute and run through it and not say a word. Uh, and there's an achievement for that. So I don't know if anybody ever got that achievement, but you can play the game totally silent um, and then the other thing um, was that you know like in real life if you've got multiple characters around you and you don't say something the other NPCs have to be able to pick up that conversation and keep keep it moving, right? So um, it was it, it was really our goal to make it feel that fluid, where if the player decides to just kind of lay in the cut and not say anything, they can because the other characters will, will continue uh, talking. So, and then even, you know, when it comes down to the supernatural abilities in the game, this is something that we started to let get the best of us very early on. Like we um, initially were like, we gotta have a ghost gun or we gotta have some sort of Spectro 3, we literally had something called the Spectro 3000 for like a week, it was so stupid. <laughs> I'm really glad we didn't keep it. <laughs> and uh, we, so we killed that. And we killed all these other mechanics that we were starting to think through and prototype that didn't have to do with communication. Like that was, if that's the core of the game, we wanted the way you interact with ghosts to also be rooted in communication. And so 
that's kind of where the radio came from. Like the, the radio in the game is this analog, creepy, um, semi-familiar, but also really weird uh, mechanic that allows Alex to talk to the ghosts and also allow the ghosts to talk to her. And the other thing that started to feel really special or interesting about that from a player character perspective was that now they were wielding what would be a weapon and something else, but they were the only one that could kind of open gates, talk to, um, uh, talk to the ghosts and not be trapped in the sort of tropes of Alex is the chosen one. It's more like she's just got a radio in her pocket. <laughs> So, you know, all these design ideas then needed to manifest through a simple visual design. And every decision that we made on how the game looks and feels was intended to, uh, you know, serve those design choices that I just walked through. So, we had, early on, we decided we wanted a really far back camera to let you see the player character, to let you see a few NPCs at once, to let you see uh, where you're exploring and kind of searching for different objects of interest, and also to encompass all the dialogue bubbles that come up. And so um, that was really something that I think before we even landed on a lot of um, where the story was going to go, we knew we wanted the camera to be this far back to feel like essentially whenever you're looking at the game, it's a shot, like a very uh, defined shot, yet at the same time, we didn't want it to be locked in, you know, very scripted cameras. Um, and another thing that we sort of came upon pretty early in the prototyping phase was our, our talk bubbles and how those talk bubbles function. Um, we kept going back to like, if in other games, you are wielding a sword or a gun or whatever, and these are these things that let you interact with the world, um, how could we make dialogue feel that way? And those talk bubbles are positioned the way that they are because we didn't want players to have to look up or down or look at sort of subtitles that are on the lower left, upper corner, whatever. We wanted them to feel as connected to Alex as possible so that while you're playing and deciding what to say, your eye is not moving around the screen. Your eye is looking at the character firmly the whole time. And if you decide to look away, that's only because you're exploring. It's, it's more of a, a choice for the player rather than having to kind of dart around. So we really wanted those talk bubbles to be, again, like an extension of Alex. Uh, oh, so another, so another kind of result of that then became, now we have these talk bubbles, we've got these characters, we've got this really zoomed out camera. Well, how fast should she be moving around? Because early on we had her just sprinting and jumping on stuff and she's having these tear jerker conversations about her dead brother and that felt, super weird and kind of mixed up. And then we're like, well, should there be a run button? And then we're like, well, what does a run button have to do in this game? And we, we tried, I don't even know, we spent months on these things that now feel to us, we kind of forget them, but we spent months trying to sort this out. And where we ended up landing was um, whenever Alex is talking, she slows to either kind of a jog or almost like a pretty brisk walk. And then when she's not talking, she speeds up and she can navigate that way. And we, hopefully that was something that it's invisible to players, but it also let them cover ground when that would be the interaction that they'd want to do, but observe and talk and not be, you know, having these crazy conversations while running through a forest. So, um, you know, a lot of these, these uh, early decisions then ended up starting to push back, where the, at, at a certain point, the mechanics and visual choices that we made did push back on the story. Um, and there, I'll give you just a couple of examples, but yeah, this was a little bit further into the development of the game. We started to go, there's some key moments in the game that now that these mechanics are truly solidified, um, let's tweak bits of the story for it. So the first one, um, which is, has been, I don't know, sort of controversial even in our own team, <laughs> is this very deliberately paced first act. So the first act of the game, about 30, 45 minutes, is you're walking and talking and hanging out with people. There's no ghosts, there's no crazy, over-the-top supernatural stuff happening. Um, it is essentially a microcosm of people's like typical senior year in high school. So you've got things like, you know, you're, you've, got, you've got these heightened versions of you're meeting somebody that you really want to impress, but there's other people there who know some dirt about you, or uh, you know that your friend has this massive crush, so are you gonna choose to help him or just like totally expose him and make him uh, embarrassed? 
And so, you know, for us, when, the, the reason why we made this decision was that we wanted people to get really familiar with Alex as a character and the movement and the core relationships with these friends before the ghost shit hits the fan because then when said shit hits the fan, uh, it just feels way crazier and more over the top because you're really familiar um, with the character and sort of the systems at play in the game. Um, and then this one, I'll try to, it's not too spoilery. Actually, it won't be spoilery. I'll speak in code. Uh, the, the conclusion of the game um, became the sum of all of our communication mechanics. So there was a point where like after alpha, actually after beta, I don't know, it was bad. <laughs> we, were, we were late in the game and we were trying to sort out the conclusion and we had these elaborate puzzles and we, had, we were like, again, kind of ham-fisting new mechanics in at the end and we went, this just doesn't fit. It like, even intellectually, where people should be at the end of this game should be more about Alex's and their emotional journey and they shouldn't be learning how to like fill water and things and move blocks around and do all these things that have nothing to do with it. And so um, we ended up going, okay, with the mechanics that they've already learned, let's let them either jettison these ghostly creatures back to the uh, strange place from where they came as, as uh, like a single sort of organism, or you can kind of negotiate and treat them as individuals and bring elements of them out with, uh, by peaceful means. But it's all done through the radio and things that you learn earlier in the game, not through introducing new mechanics. So all these decisions came together to make a game that our team is uh, super proud of. I mean, we're beyond grateful to have this community of players now who have connected with Alex both inside but also outside of the game. Like it totally blows us away every time we see any of this stuff. Um, and we, you know, I think we're, we feel that we're pretty sure that the community is connected with her uh, because they can feel that when we were making it, we were always more worried about why Alex would do something, why she would make a decision, why she would uh, put herself in harm's way, as opposed to anything else. Like that was the most important thing, that was the guiding principle for the whole game. Um, and we feel like it's really sort of paid off in making something pretty special. Uh, this slide makes me laugh when I'm looking at it. Uh, this is, I'm, you guys have probably seen this kind of classic quote from Pixar founder and uh, Disney CCO John Lasseter where he talks about kind of the interplay between art and technology, right? And so for, for those guys, the art uh, challenges the technology and then the technology inspires the art. And for us, we've kind of like morphed and mutated that kind of basic idea where for us we want to continue to approach game making through this lens of story inspiring our mechanics um, but then we will build mechanics that empower players to tell their own stories. So I hope this uh, talk has given you some interesting ideas to explore as well and thank you. Do we have Q&A time? I don't know how long I've been up here. Sweet. How do we do that? <laughs> Can't see, just hurdle questions. There we go, how's it going? Hey. Uh, my name is Oded, I'm also a point and click adventure game designer, developer, indie. Um, I'm very interested in learning about the, like, the prototyping, playtesting, early stages, because this game, when I played it, it felt like the, the voice acting and all, all that was a very uh, strong part, and I, I'm curious, how did you do that before, like in early stages of the development? So uh, it was pretty funny. We would record scratch audio in our bathroom uh, at the office and uh, we would come up with these really just ridiculous small scenarios, none of which made it into the game and Adam would write these scripts that would be like, okay, here is a challenge to overcome and here's a lot of branching options and let's test out basically all those systems that I was just talking through. And so. Um, we, we did that for a while, like we did not do any casting or any of the real, you know, solid, solidified writing until we had gone through that prototyping phase. But early on, Bryant, who's also here, who was our lead engineer, um, was working on a tool that was intended to be a very visual, simple design tool that ideally any designer or writer who's not hyper technical can get into and use. It's a visual kind of node based thing so that you could even play something out without dropping it into a full scene. Um, we, to be perfectly honest, 
honest, it, came, it all came in way too hot. Like we were halfway through the game and the, the, like core, some of the core tools were still getting built. The story was changing for a long time. So I'd like to say that we, in the first three months, had this like, yes, here it is moment, but we were at alpha still like crapping our pants. Uh, so it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, for us, we were kind of doing two or three things at once. There was a lot of art tests happening um, that were not taking into account a lot of the dialogue. And then there were a lot of like script tests happening based on the tool set that Bryant was building. And then we would just let people play it. That was pretty much it. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, since most games kind of take control away from the player, lock the camera, et cetera, to force the player to view the story, did you guys have issues with play testers walking away from conversations and missing out on parts of the story or, or did the delivery of certain voice lines that kind of took away from their experience? All the time. Uh, like, yeah, the, early, the earliest versions of the game, we wanted to let you go anywhere at any time and never back, or be able to backtrack, go wherever you want, and have a lot of conversations be location agnostic. And we ended up having to kind of hone that in. And I think for our next stuff, we'd still like to find ways to improve more of that and let important conversations sort of happen anywhere. But yeah, the biggest challenges were like, how long should a scene be? How long should a chunk of dialogue be? Because if a character is moving, if a player is moving too quickly from one waypoint to another, they're going to trigger the next conversation too early. Or uh, are they going to run along and then there's just a long dead stretch of space? Or are they going to go backwards and not be able to talk about anything. And so um, it, I, it, all credit goes to Adam and his maniacal writing process for finding ways to fill in and kind of shave off the edges of that. But there was never like a magic bullet for it. It was just a lot of play testing and finding where people went and how to guide them and how long scenes should be. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, so awesome game. Uh, the, the timing, I think, is like really crucial to the, like, the dialogue mechanics in Oxenfree, like how long the options stay on screen or how long the conversation pauses while we're, the, the system's waiting to see if the character is going to reply. Or... Was there any science that went into choosing those numbers, or do you guys just sort of feel it out and watch play test? Or... That was another uh, just duct tape and a prayer thing. <laughs> it, uh, we, early on, we did want a science and a, and a consistent thing for it. And it's something that, you know, response-wise to the game, some people really love exactly how it was timed and other people are kind of pissed off about it. But ultimately, most of those lines and how the interrupts work, but sometimes you cut somebody off right in the middle of a line, sometimes you, they say their whole line, uh, was all just hand tweaked, basically. Because it's like maybe a line has some really crucial information that you know an NPC might be saying something that you need to hear, so we're going to let that whole line play. But if it's more just a feel thing, as often as possible, we wanted you to just cut people off, no matter what. So. That would be the like perfect world version, but like half the lines are not that way because they're just for uh, subjective reasons. Quick follow-up question: Did you ever measure that like cutting off other characters, and did that ever feed back into the relationships between the characters? Not the cutting off, no. Okay. But thank you. We're going to take that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> thank you. Did you systemically deal with interrupting conversations? Or were they custom every time when Alex chose to speak or not? Um, sorry, could you say that again? So other characters are speaking, Alex yep. responds in the middle, cuts people off. Yep. Did you have to systemically deal with then resuming or how to deal with all of that? A lot, yes. So again, crazy writer Adam down there. Um, there are, <laughs> there's, we, as often as possible, we'd like the character, the NPCs or Alex to be able to pick up the conversation. So if we, if you cut somebody off in the middle of any line, we don't want it to just like awkwardly jump back into the conversation. So we, there's a lot of lines in the game, hundreds of lines where they'll be like, okay, back to what we were talking about or, you know, things like that. So um, yes, there's definitely a, a system for, for all of that in place. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Molly. I'm an artist, so I have a lot of like art questions for you, but um, I'll keep it to just a mechanics question. Um, the radio idea is really interesting to me, and that mechanic is like fascinating. Um, how did you guys come up with that? Like, what inspired it? So. Early on, it actually became uh, like an offshoot of another idea. Early on, we wanted to have a tape 
recorder. And that tape recorder, we're gonna let you record a bunch of stuff in the world and run around with that. And then, and Brian still wants it, and he's <laughs> bummed out that it's not in the game. Uh, and it got totally crazy, and we went, no, let, look, what are the elements that we really like about it? And uh, back to that communication thing, we thought, you know, what is, it, what is something that's familiar, and radio is familiar, and what is something that's creepy? So we thought about, you know, radios in Silent Hill were a really big piece of that, that feeling of the static, and that feeling of like, I'm getting a very guttural piece of feedback from the game, but it's also not like direct, you don't know what it means all the time. And so we thought it could be this really kind of cool coded thing. So for us, early on, the radio, we kind of looked at it as, um, aesthetically like the, the Silent Hill radio, and then it, mechanically we want it to be like the Ocarina in Ocarina of Time, where you can um, you know, have sequences of things that you can plug in, like a puzzle or tunes or things like that. And so it kind of became both of those, essentially. We wanted it to be, some, the, the other big piece was that we wanted players to have some form of like analog expression while they're playing, and you know, instead of just choosing dialogue choices, so being able to bust that radio out whenever you want and pick up little sequences and listen to other stations just felt pretty cool. Um, so it was kind of all those things, but it was it took a long time to get to it. That's awesome. Thank you. I was just told, I'm so sorry, sir, I was just told that was the last question. But I'll talk to you out there. <laughs> um, okay, thank you guys so much.